Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, and welcome to this worship of the United Methodist Church of Westport and Weston. I'm Reverend Heather Sinclair, the pastor here, and it is a blessing to welcome you from near and far into this time where we can be gathered together as the worshiping body of Christ. If you are visiting us, I hope that you will check out our website, westportumc.org and sign up to be connected through our email list. Watch both of those places for any updates on events and activities that are taking place, because although the church building is closed, the church itself is still open and alive. I want to thank everyone who participated in the church building reopening survey. We have received your survey results and we are grateful for them. The task force will be looking through them and they will help us as we discern and make decisions for the time when we reopen the church building. If you did not respond to the survey and you wish to add some comments, please send me a message. This morning, Zoom fellowship will begin 10 minutes after the end of worship. Email me or text me if you do not have the link for that gathering. And as we prepare for worship, let us now breathe in the Holy Spirit and breathe out the distractions of the day so that we can be in tune to the presence of God in our worship. We have come to worship, to sing, and pray, and hear God's word, because God's love lasts forever. Even when God seems far away, we know God's love lasts forever. Even when nothing is going right and we are ready to give up, we know God's love lasts forever. When people treat us badly, we know God's love lasts forever. When we are all alone and feel like no one loves us, we know God's love lasts forever. 
Let us worship God together. control the way we live. Let us not give in to sinful desires. Rather, let us offer ourselves to God, who mercifully has brought us from death to life. Let us pray. O oh God, we confess that we have sinned in your sight. Despite our best efforts and intentions, we have failed to consistently live in ways that bring honor to your name. We have sinned by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have sinned by turning away from you. Forgive us. Through the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, set us free from the grip of sin, from attitudes and actions that do not lead to life. Once we were captive to sin, living lives that led only to death. But thanks be to God. In God's mercy, God has set us free from the power of sin and death and has offered us forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now you are free to choose life and to use your life to bring honor and glory to God. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. Share the peace of Christ. Hi, good morning and welcome. I'm sitting here on the front steps of our home and I've been looking at our welcome mat. It looks a little bit faded uh, I think it's more because of the wind and the sun and the rain of weather, not because people have been walking over it, because sadly, we haven't had that many people over to our house recently. We've tried, been staying home and staying safe, and so we haven't had friends over for play dates or people over for dinner, and, and that's sad, and I'm, I'm thinking that you're sad because you haven't been able to have those play dates or movie nights or whatever it is that you have fun times when you welcome people into your house. 
And at church, we haven't been able to welcome each other to worship or to Sunday school or to other events. And that too is sad because we love to smile and say hi and shake hands or hug and we haven't been able to do that. And it's gonna be a little while before we can. So I've been thinking about what it means to say welcome if we can't actually be with each other. Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. Meaning whoever welcomes each of us is welcoming Jesus. And whenever we welcome someone else, we welcome Jesus. And I think Jesus is talking about more than just a handshake and a hello. He's talking about offering love to people, caring for them, respecting them, helping them. And in that way, welcoming them with the love of God. So even if you can't welcome someone into your home, or into the church, I hope that you will think about ways that you can welcome as Jesus welcomes, as you can share love. Maybe it's by writing someone a note, sending them a text, coloring today's coloring page for them, calling them and saying hello, or maybe leaving some cookies on their doorstep and running away. All of those are ways that we shall welcome and care and love as Jesus welcomes and cares and loves us. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your love and your welcome, and we ask that you help us to love and to welcome all with the love of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello and welcome. Today's scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have brought, been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means! Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks to be, be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your, your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, for you are our strength and our salvation. First, I want to thank Harry for his reading of the scripture this morning. Romans in general and this passage in particular is not easy. 
For the past few weeks, the Wednesday evening Bible study has been studying and wrestling with Romans, and I encourage you to join us for the remainder of those discussions for the next few weeks. One of the best aspects of studying in a group is the sharing of different versions and translations. A different word or phrase here or there can make a dramatic difference in the understanding of the text. This morning, I want to read to you again Romans 6, 12-23 from the message, for it is in many ways a sermon itself. You must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time, remember you've been raised from the dead, into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want? Since we're free, from, we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourself to the ways of God, and the freedom never quits. All your life, you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one who commands you set free to live openly in God's freedom. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became, and the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness? As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? A dead end. But now that you've found that you don't have to sit and listen to sin tell you what to do, you have discovered the delight of listening to God telling you. What a surprise. A whole, healed, put-together life right now with more and more life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life, and your pension is death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. Most often, when we consider freedom, we are referring to freedom from something. We strive to be free, to do what we want to do. We highly value individualism, something which would have made little sense for Paul and his readers in early Christian communities. For Paul, everyone had to belong to something. Everyone had to be loyal to a master, a god, or an empire. For us, that kind of loyalty may still be sometimes found in patriotism and family ties, or perhaps spirit for a team or a school. For Paul, this kind of loyalty and attachment brings in the, la the language of slavery, a difficult reading for African Americans and for those from colonized nations because of the oppressive history. In the Roman Empire, up to one-third of all people were slaves, by birth, by military conquest, or even selling themselves to pay their debts. Likely there were slaves in the Christian community, slaves hearing these letters of Paul. Paul is not making a moral judgment on slavery. He is stating the cultural reality and inviting a shift in understanding the relationship between the believer and Christ. For the Christian, 
Our identity must come from the one who has the strongest claim on our life. We are who we are because of Christ, to whom we belong. Freedom in Christ is not my right to do as I wish, but being set free from slavery to sin and for obedience to God. A current day example. Wearing masks and social distancing does not restrict my freedom. Instead, it gives freedom and protection so that we all may be free from this virus and return to normal life. Romans 6.19 in the message says, There are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness? God's freedom invites us into an ever-growing, ever-perfecting life of personal and social holiness. In 1914, poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox, who spent part of her life here in Connecticut and may be best known for the poetic line, laugh and the world laughs with you, weep and you weep alone. In 1914, she published a poem entitled protest, and it begins with this line. To sin by silence when we should protest makes cowards out of men. The poem continues to name the sins of injustice, ignorance, and lust against which humanity must speak. In the concluding stanza, Wilcox critiques the freedom of this land. Therefore, I do protest against the boast of independence in this mighty land. Call no chain strong which holds one rusted link. Call no land free that holds one fettered slave. Until the manacled slim wrists of babes are loose to toss in childish sport and glee. Until the mother bears no burden save the precious one beneath her heart until God's soil is rescued from the clutch of greed and given back to labor, let no man call this the land of freedom. Those are challenging words, especially as Independence Day, July 4th, approaches. They're words that call us to examine what it means to be free. We must ask ourselves, can I be truly free? if another child of God is not free? Our freedom in Christ calls us to obedience to the will of God, or as the message phrases it, the delight of listening what God is telling what, you, what to do with your life. Our freedom in Christ calls us not only to die to sin in ourselves, we'll talk more about individual sin next week, but to work to rid the world of collective sin. As the month of June draws to a close, we mark Pride Sunday. A quieter, less public celebration is taking place in these days, but the message of love and inclusion is as important as ever. Likewise, racial tensions have surfaced to an extent that we cannot remain silent. The Christian voice is essential. Race, racism, homophobia, sexism, and prejudice of any kind are sins. They are sins because they devalue the created image of God in all of God's children. They are sins because they do not welcome love and respect as Christ welcomes, loves, and respects. They are sins because Christ came to tear down walls, not build them up. They are sins because people are harmed and lose their God-given lives in the name of these isms. They are sins because we who have the power to speak and to act and to change do not. 
And these sins are deeply entrenched in our society. Individually, we must be aware of our words and actions that devalue another. The deeper sin is the way that power has been and continues to be given and taken based on race, gender, and sexual orientation. We must die to these collective sins, rise and raise others up to new life. I invite you to join me in learning more about the sins that exist in our nation, in our world, and what we who have privilege might do to tear them down. Last week, we remembered our baptism and the newness of life that comes from receiving the waters and grace of baptism. The baptismal font is the beginning of Christian faith. It is the place where we make a promise to be obedient to God and receive God's promise of freedom and new life. Traditionally, in ancient churches and medieval cathedrals around the world, the baptismal font is placed as it is here, near the entrance and exit, in, the, in sight when people enter and when they leave. As one enters the sanctuary, they are reminded of their baptism and the unity of, in Christ of the gathered congregation. And upon exiting, the baptismal font is a call to service, a call to live into freedom from sin and for obedience to Christ, a call to do justice and love mercy so that all may live in freedom. The waters of this font are our call, our reminder that we live in the blessing of eternal life, now and always. Let us pray. Merciful God, remind us always of our baptism, not as a place and a moment, but as a beginning of our call to live in Christ. Strengthen us to learn of the burdens that weigh down the people of God. Empower us to speak and to act. Encourage us to carry the remembrance of the freedom that comes from our baptism into the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, who gives all of the children of God the free gift of freedom and grace. We give you thanks and praise for the abundance of your gifts. May we use them to continue your work of justice and mercy in the world. Amen. So despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the cold, rugged cross. 
Till my trophies at last I lay down, I will sing to thee, O Prophet Cross, and exchange it some day for a crown. This morning we come bringing many prayers that are on our hearts and our minds. I want to begin by giving thanks for the generous donations to the clothing drive last weekend. Those donations were brought to person to person and to Goodwill in Norwalk and they will be a blessing to many in need. Also a prayer of celebration for Ryan Searles who graduated from Western New England University and for all of our graduates as they discern plans for the future. We pray for peace and comfort for those who mourn the passing of loved ones. We pray for healing and strength for many who are ill, for Shirley, for George, for Evan and Meredith. And we give prayers of thanksgiving for healing for Laura's parents. We continue to pray for all of those who are victims of natural and human disasters, for violence, caused by racism and hatred, we pray for our community, our nation, and our world. Let us pray. 
O oh God, we come before you as your beloved children. We are made in your glorious and diverse image. Open our eyes to see the beauty in each and every piece of creation and each and every child who you have named and created as beloved. We pray today for those who the world has not named beloved, those who are desperately seeking freedom and liberation, for those who face oppression and marginalization, for those who are victims of violence, terror, and fear. We pray for those who face sickness and infirmities. We pray for those who sit in hospital rooms with no one to visit them. We pray for those who suffer from the coronavirus and from other diseases that are ravaging our world. We pray for those who are suffering from the sicknesses of racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, and all sorts of isms and phobias that pervert the mind and soul. We pray for the hungry. We pray for those who inhabit our streets with no homes, for those who are looking for their next meal. We pray for the thirsty. We believe that you are the giver of living water. May we be the hands that give that refreshment. We pray for those without clothing. May we be the ones who clothe them. We pray for all who sit alone in prison this morning and have no one to visit them. We pray for their liberation. We pray for the strangers in our midst this morning. May we welcome them into our lives and hearts as Christ welcomes us. We pray for those who have lost people that they love, all of those who are in mourning and grief. We pray also for the dead this morning. May they rest in peace from their labors. May the memories of them sustain us and give us peace. May we live in eternal life, confident that Christ is with us now and always. Remind us of the call that comes through our baptism in Christ. Challenge us with wisdom and courage so that we may be free from narrow ways of thinking that condemn your good work in and through us. Encourage us to build bridges of hope. May all be freed by your love, O oh God. For we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the glory, now and forever. Amen. When we walk with the Lord,
siblings in Christ. Receive the gift of freedom in Christ. May it rise you up to new life so that you may raise others up to new life in Christ as well. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.